Hi, welcome to another edition of Healthcare's Missing Link, a podcast where we try to help you uncover the things that are trying to steal your health. Now today, I'm Dr. Mark Sherwood, of course, and we get to talk to a wonderful friend, colleague, and a, just a beautiful human being, Dr. David Hazy, about how thoughts affect your brain. So welcome, Dr. Hazy. Thanks for being with us, man. We really appreciate it. Oh, Dr. Sherwood, thank you very much. Mark, you know, this has been, uh, you've been a great friend. We've been great colleagues for many years. And uh, uh, this is actually an interview I'm really looking forward to, just to have this discussion together. Mm-hmm. Really well, you, really you've you been a big old, big blessing to us. You were a guest on our movie, Work Your Diet, and, and it just you did an amazing job. And it was one of the, the favorite lines that people had in that movie was, you're never too old. And they, they love that. So thank you for that as well. Yeah, you bet. You bet. It is. It really is. You, you are never too old to uh, make a change. The body is creating health until you're in the ground, right? Love that. So, you know, I'll begin with this. You know, you, I've heard you speak, I've heard you teach, and I've got to know you as a, as a friend and, and person. Uh, what, what is the, the passion that you have and what drives you? Wow. You know, honestly, curiosity. Um, I, you know, I just have an absolute sense of wonder about reality. I, I think that, you know, we're, I'm a little different. I, I love the days I'm wrong. I really love the days that I have to change my mind uh, because that means I've learned something new and mm-hmm. the picture's gotten a little more clear. And mm-hmm. And I absolutely love working with people to help them be the fullest versions of themselves. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's been a long road, right? You've been, been practicing medicine very actively for over 25 years now and, and have and I got to sit knee to knee with a lot of people and it never gets old. I love the human experience and, mm-hmm. and getting to just be in the mess uh, and mm-hmm. getting to ask more interesting questions and seek more difficult answers. Uh, I mean, honestly, there's not a better job in the world. So, Wow. What a, what a great answer. I love it when I'm wrong because <laughs> I've learned something new. Man, you know, I, I've got to ask this question because... Um, you know, at the time of this recording, much has been talked about regarding America's health status, et cetera. But what's your take on America's health and where it is right now? You know, uh, so we're right in the heart of the COVID epidemic, you know, what are we recording this around you know, in July? And so what I've really been impressed by with the American health status, I mean, is is just how much we are influenced by the noises around us. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, there's so many voices that are going on all the time. And you know, part of doing this podcast is to add our voice to the chorus. And I hope be really a voice that advocates for reasonability and rationality and, um, you know, and uh, truth and justice in the American way and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. That's but, perfect. But, <laughs> but uh, I think that there are so many voices of fear mm. and there's so many voices of inadequacy and fear and voices of you're not enough and you're not capable and you must have somebody else's help to change your life. And you, you are not enough. And mm. I think that that comes really from our Madison Avenue uh, advertising world, because, you know, how do you make somebody buy something? Well, you convince them that what they have is not enough. You mm. tell them that they're wrong, you know, that their very existence is not valid unless they own this thing or do this thing. And that has been a pervasive uh, onslaught of messaging. And it goes along with fear because how do you sell more news or how do you keep people to get people to scroll some more? Uh, How do you get them to look for the next tweet, the next post? Well, you give them a sense that they're not fulfilled yet, that they don't know the full picture. And we've gotten down from wisdom into sound bites. So I think that the state of our health currently has a lot to do with the state of how our media is represented and what media continues to pump into our mind, into our soul, and, and then the, how that changes what we value. And, 
it's very important to remember that you as a human are infinitely valuable, period, end of story. <laughs> Zero question about that. It doesn't require anything from the outside to make you worth working on. And that health is your greatest asset, but you get to create so much of your health from the inside out. It's really not about the things that people do to and for you from the outside in that are what's going to save you. Now, those can be really helpful things, but outside of you creating health from the inside out and doing that in a state of community, it's not going to be uh, effective at the level that I'm certainly certain that you desire. So, yeah, I think the state of our health in the United States is one that's focused on fear and on on inadequacy and mm. on dependence. And, mm. and that's, those aren't great ways to get towards health. Well, let me ask you this. And, and that was great. You know, and two questions I'd have to follow up in one, I'll start with the second half of your answer. How does one filter properly that thing that you mentioned is those sound bites that continue to bleed into us, whether it be social media or, or audio or things we read. How do we filter that, David? Mm. You turn them off. Yeah. So, <laughs> so there's two answers to that question, really. Number one is you decrease the number of sound bites that are coming in. And um, I read a book in college that was really influential for me, and it was How the News Makes Us Dumb by Neil Postman. And that was written back in 1988. 1987 something and it was profound you know, the whole issue was that the news is created to make us hungry for more information not to inform us if you want to be informed get long format information you know read things like the economist or the atlantic or um, dig into history and then ask questions about how does that apply to today um, so I, I would say, number one, you just turn it off. And number two, you look at this information in the context of, you know, is it good? Is it true? Is it supportive? Is, is it something that you want more of in the world? Because there's so many messages going around right now uh, from a whole bunch of different sides that are really just about having power, right? Not yeah. about creating good, not about leaving a legacy that you're going to be really proud of for your children and your grandchildren. It's instead, you know, supporting your own little subgroup. And that's a good check and balance. It's like, you know, is this wholesome? Uh, I like the word wholesome a lot mm -hmm. because we're always seeking wholeness in, and I think in regenerative and functional and integrative healthcare, wholeness is the goal. Mm -hmm. And, and I think if we ask, is this information wholesome, then we have some really good internal filters, except when we don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And yeah, right. Can, can, I, can I talk about cognitive dissonance? Just yes, yeah, please. Yeah, because I think this is really important because what I just said sounds good, but none of us are capable of doing it yeah. because all of us are actually coming to today with the brain that we have shaped with all of our tomorrows or all of our yesterdays, excuse me. Mm. And so we come to today with the brain that we shaped through all of our yesterdays and every decision we made, every idea that we've had, every action that we've taken has gone into the library and literally created a connectome, mm -hmm. a, a network of connections inside the brain that makes some actions and thoughts and conclusions easy for our brain. It's like, Ooh, that this goes on cruise control and other thoughts and actions and behaviors and beliefs really difficult. And therefore when we are confronted with information that doesn't suit us, that doesn't suit with our past beliefs and actions, it literally causes brain pain, brain yeah. pain. And, and so that brain pain makes us want to dismiss or distort or just delete information that doesn't fit with how our brain is currently. And this is really dangerous for us in the health world because oftentimes people are stuck by their automatic beliefs. And then it becomes really dangerous in the world of uh, corporate living 
where, you know, we get into these habits with our spouse and our children and our Mm -hmm. employer and our employees, you know, stepping back and bringing down the stress level Mm -hmm. allows our neocortex to be able to fire off and examine the information more closely. And in what may be actually necessary is us to engage this information that's difficult with friends we disagree with. This is why it's so important to have conversations in the midst of trials and tribulations, to go to the people who are experiencing challenge. Right now, there's a large Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter movement, and it's very important to have conversations with people you disagree with. And, And that induces neuroplasticity. I'm going to guarantee yep. you, Mark, the people who yep. have that level of curiosity are going to have resistance against Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Because we we know the people who continue to learn have this remarkable resistance against Alzheimer's disease. It's it's almost unexplainable the fact that we can grow ourselves out in some ways of the likelihood of developing Alzheimer's disease. But that comes through curiosity. Mm-hmm. That comes through questioning and that comes through understanding your brain so that you're not a captive to your brain. That's Mm. the real opportunity here for so many people. I like that because um, along those lines, I think it goes into the saying that we all understand it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. I think it goes back to probably those neural neural pathways, but can fear and can these pathways become addictive? Well, so I think addictive is a really interesting word. Mm -hmm. Um, Can this fear be, tell me more. Can you ask that question another way? Yeah, I'm I'm asking is, is because it becomes so normal, because it becomes what we do, who we are, it's ingrained in us. Is it possible to get out of the fear-based thing than it is it is to stay in it? I guess what I'm asking is, is it more comfortable to stay in a dysfunctional place or lack of wholeness place than it would be to move out of that place. Yes. I mean, you, that's a, such a great way of asking that because think, I always think of this example of the battered wife. Mm. I I have walked with many women through the course of horrific circumstances at home as their physician and counseled them on how can they escape? Where can they find a shelter? What is next? Um, I have seen with absolute dismay how women will go back again and again to horrible, abusive situation. I'm just, men do this too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Men do this too, actually. uh, And go back into the same difficult circumstance. And many times those women have had a very abusive upbringing and uh, actually every time in my experience, but, but why is that? Because especially in early life, we shape a brain, we get used to a particular environment and our brain has to have less electrical activity, essentially is Mm. more efficient at processing an an environment that is familiar. Yeah. This is why we feel so relaxed at a place where we've been for many years. We walk in Mm -hmm. and we don't think about environment. It's just part of us. It's why we feel comfortable around people that we've been around for a long time, which we, we feel like it is us where we can be ourselves in that area. Even if we don't like ourselves, we can be ourselves. And so absolutely, we get used to whatever we do repeatedly, whoever we're with repeatedly, wherever we're at repeatedly. Those become part of what's called the default mode network in the mm-hmm. brain. And the default mode network is this series of neurons that is always answering these interesting questions of who am I? Where am I? How am I? It's our context generator. And so it's always giving a definition for you so that you can act in the world today, now. And neurons that fire together wire together. That's a reality of our brain. Whatever you do, whatever you think, whatever you believe, you're going to get better at doing, thinking, and believing that thing. And marketers know this. And politicians know this. And, you know, the people who want to influence your vote, want to influence your purchases, 
they know that if they can just get a regular message across, especially one that is tied to emotion, mm -hmm. then you're going to start being brainwashed into that very thought pattern. And it's so mm -hmm. insidious. And you may actually even disagree with yourself if you have the opportunity to get out of a semi fight or flight status. Yeah. But especially when you're stressed, we, we run on automatic and with COVID and with uh, the protests that have gone on and with who knows what's next sunspots. Uh, I saw a bubonic plague was found in a squirrel in Colorado. <laughs> like, yeah, this is 2020 right here, right? <laughs> now the bubonic plague, let me just say that it's normal for, uh, rodents in Colorado to have, there are normal reservoir of uh, Yersinia pestis, which is mm -hmm. the bubonic plague. So it's, it's the groundhogs that actually carry it. But so it's weird to see it in a squirrel, but it was just kind of funny that in this date and time, the mm -hmm. setup for our brain is that yeah. everything is going to go wrong, right? <laughs> right, right. Everything's going to kill you. It's it right now. <laughs> Everything's going to get you, man. Yeah. Uh, and so... Yeah, it takes a lot of forth, not, not just thought to get out of these patterns, but it takes behavior. You actually have to practice calming down. Mm -hmm. I strongly recommend a meditation practice because mm -hmm. meditation is going to, you know, take that wind out of your wind out of the sails of stress. So it's going to bring down that level of stress in a way that you know, you're going to be able to use your higher centers of learning, the mm -hmm. neocortex, and not be stuck in these, this reptilian brain that's yep. dealing with a real rampant emotion. And so um, yeah. it absolutely can be changed, uh, but it's hard. It does take time, effort, and understanding. Uh, Would you agree that it takes more than 21 days in your assessment to change a habit? Oh, I don't know. Where did that, you know, 21 days, I'm sure that came out of Madison Avenue. So. Yeah, it, uh, it was a thought that was put out there and it's been perpetuated so much that people believe that to be all it takes. But yeah, I personally yeah. found that that's not true at all. It's variable <laughs> with different people, man. It's variable <laughs> with different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. 21 days, where did that come from, right? But I'll tell you, so we do a lot of neurofeedback in our practice. Mm -hmm. And neurofeedback is really cool because I get to actually watch people learn uh, on a screen. Uh, what, what neurofeedback is, is biofeedback. Mm -hmm. uh, helping you change something about your body just via your awareness. So the way it works, we put a cap on people's heads and we measure an EEG. This is the electrical brain waves that come off of the brain. And then we uh, examine that against a large database of average normal brains. Now, there is no such thing as a normal brain. <laughs> right. There really isn't. And, but, but we're looking for deviation for electrical inefficiencies in this three-dimensional network that would correspond with the symptoms or the challenges that person is having. Because... Psychiatric problems are neurologic problems, mostly. Yeah. So you have psychology, your, your beliefs, and then you have neurology. Psychiatry is just kind of where you're trying to put them all together. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what you can do is now that we know what the electrical activity of the brain is, and we know that it's not really what we want it to be, we can put that cap back on someone's head and we can uh, start watching their brain waves with the computer um, and then play a movie in front of them. And when their brain waves get closer to what we want to reinforce, then the movie is going to play bright and loud. And when their brain waves go away from what we want to reinforce, the movie will get dark and quiet. And the brain wants to watch the movie. The brain mm. wants stimulation. The brain wants it to go on. So it will figure out this three-dimensional electrical combination lock to make the movie play. And because neurons that fire together wire together, that brain actually learns how to have a different electrical efficiency in many of these areas. So 
we can watch people through our learning curves and our tracking and our statistics. Are they learning even in a session? So the answer is twofold, Mark. People learn in the space of 20 minutes tremendously. So we can see this in neurofeedback. We see long-term changes in their neurological efficiency to do mm-hmm. a particular task, which is really what learning is. Yeah. And, but then that continues to progress, and it usually takes like 20 sessions to start uh, to really make a movement in someone's brain long-term. But guess what? They will keep those changes mm-hmm. long-term unless there's some horrible catastrophic event. Now, that 21 days, I think it's kind of a useful thing to say, yeah. because if you can get somebody to do something for 21 days, <laughs> you're doing something these days, right? you, yeah. you have made a big dent in them yeah. getting to the 42 day mark. Yeah, yes, and sir. I'm getting to the 84 day mark. <laughs> right. And so um, that is it's I'm not against that. I won't slam the 21 day thing. But yeah. When people feel like, oh, I've done that work yeah. and it didn't work for me. Oh, that, you no. Know, Neurons that fire together, wire together. And if you put other new influences back in the pot, your brain is going to relearn. It's going to get back in that electrical rut again Mm -hmm. for where you have been. And um, it's, 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 I think of electrical ruts because how long have you been doing a particular thing? How deeply attached to it are you? How much of it is part of who you believe you are or what you believe about how the world is? that makes a really big difference. We don't pay a lot of attention to those things when we discuss, well, what's the right diet or exercise program or, you know, you really have to get into the mind of the person and and have generosity and kindness to make those next steps that move forward. I like that because I've used the analogy before for people to understand that our lives can get where they're on autopilot, where we're driving a car down deep ruts, where you can literally take your hands off the wheel. And no matter what comes your way, you're going to keep going down that pathway because you've always done that. And to bring about change, you have to grab the wheel and you have to almost fight against gravity, you know, try to get it out of the ruts to create new ruts. So that's kind of what you're saying. I think the key is, correct me if I'm wrong, is a willingness to bring awareness to maybe what you don't know. Would that be accurate? Yeah, and to practice it yeah. again and again and again. This is why talk therapy works. It's why even writing therapy works. If you want to change a belief or a pattern in your life, grab a journal. Start writing about your feelings. You actually will start changing your relationship to those feelings. Many people have worked themselves out of PTSD with just journaling. Now, I'm not saying that it is sufficient yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that we have a remarkable capacity to rewire ourselves by focusing mm-hmm. on different aspects of who we are. And um, What would you say to someone that is, is listening to this? And they say, come on, Dr. Hazi, I, I know what you're saying, but you don't understand. I've been doing this for a long time. It's hard for me to change. What would you say to that person? I would say you're absolutely right. <laughs> exactly because of the statement right you're absolutely right yeah absolutely you're right yep and it, you're absolutely right it is hard to change and and now the question is is it worth it to you to change mm. is, is, you know is that you know you're absolutely right you're going to have to put effort energy possibly money time into doing this work and it is going to be work and then you have to ask yourself what's your why yeah. Why are you doing this? What is your, and then ask questions that help them see what a massive why that they, they do have. Many people don't realize how important they are in the world. Yes. Many people don't yes. realize yeah. what a massive contribution just being here is to the rest of the world and what a role they may even play as somebody who needs to be cared for. Because there's and probably another person out there who needs the meaning in life to care for a person. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're way too Madison Avenue-y about yeah. what is worthwhile. Is it just the why 
on the superficial side, it's like, oh, I want to be thinner. I want to look better. I want to, you know, I have more money. I want, you know, a younger woman hanging off my arm. I want a you know, greater focus. You know, I want a faster car. I want a bigger house. You know, no, you really probably don't. <laughs> you know, if you ask, yeah. what's your why behind your why? It's like, oh, I, I want to feel like I have worth. Oh, I want to be the father that I know I can be. Mm. Uh, I want, you know, I want to, I have gifts to give to the world and I want to give those gifts to the world. And then those whys are powerful enough to make the hard work worth it. Those mm. whys are able to give this immense, really an infinite amount of fuel for change. If somebody must do something and they are mm -hmm. convinced they must do it, uh, uh, heaven and earth cannot keep them from that. It's how do you get your bigger why? I love that. So people first, you're saying, have to understand they're incredibly valuable and loved. And then second, they have to understand that because of that, they have value and love to give to the world. How important is what we continually speak out of our mouth thrown into that matrix of bringing about change? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Mark, it's kind of funny. I, I've talked with you a while, but I actually know, from just from listening to you, who the pastor is that's most influenced you in your life. Mm -hmm. do, you know, do, you, who, do you know who I'm talking about? Tell me. I want to hear it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah you. Yes, it is. It's me. Right? Yeah. You're right. Because uh -huh. I'm saying it. I believe it. You're right. Exactly. And, yeah. you know, uh, you know, I play that little trick on patients sometimes and I'll mm -hmm. say, you know, yeah, I know. I know what uh, shaman, pastor, you know, whatever people of influence are that, you know, I know who it is. And because who do you trust the most in this world? Mm -hmm. You, you know, so you take information for who you trust the most. And all you have to do is to walk forward four steps mindfully, and you realize that walking is essentially a controlled fall. Always, <laughs> I love that. You're always falling. Yeah. And, and you trust yourself to put the other foot out in front so that you're going to catch yourself again. You trust that when you think of the word orange, your mouth says the word orange. You have been convinced and convicted so many times mm -hmm. that you can trust you. Yep. That everything you say bounces off of a wall and hits your ear and preaches to yourself what reality is. You are constantly exerting massive effects upon your own understanding of reality by what you say. So if you want to change your world, Changing your language is essential. Mm. What you speak creates your internal reality. You know, everybody says, oh, what you see, you know, you're going to make your reality. Well, you are going to make your internal reality. That is absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. it may or may not affect the external reality, but you're absolutely going to create your internal reality via your words. And so to hold every thought captive and to be... Uh, careful of what the tongue does yeah. gives immense benefits in life. And mm -hmm. this is where uh, affirmations come in. This is where choosing language that is supportive, that is hopeful, that is determined is exceedingly important because we're going to believe, especially what we say about ourselves. And if we say, wow, I, I just can't do this, or I am this, or I uh, shouldn't, or I couldn't, or I wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're actually making a declaration yeah. to yourself yeah. way more than you are to the outside world. So your words are of infinite importance for you shaping your brain. Because again, this is neurofeedback. Yes. You say, right. you say, you know, I am worthless. And, mm. and then in your brain, your brain says, oh, man, um, you know, the sky didn't fall. I didn't get hit with a bolt of lightning. I didn't get punished for saying that. That must have been right. And you know, yeah. okay, so I am yeah. worthless. And the brain wants to be efficient. Our yeah. brains are lazy, Mark. <laughs> no, that's a really a core understanding. 
that we consume 23% of our daily energy in this mush inside our head. 23%. Yeah, 20, so 2%, about 2.5% of our body weight um, is consuming 23% of our energy. It runs hot. Mm. It is making electricity 24-7. And so it is always looking for how can it be more efficient? How can it fire off less energy? You know, when you think hard or you're, you're learning a new task, how yep. you, your brain just gets tired. <laughs> well, the only way it can't keep getting tired if you keep doing that is to wire it more densely. So yep. you know how uh, wires will get hot, right? You, you yeah, when they're working over time, they get hot. Right. You feel, especially if you're trying to put too much current to, to, through too thin of a wire. Well, how do you make it not overheat? Well, you lay down some more wire, more wire, you make that wire thicker. That's called neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. That is the physical process of learning. Changing your mind, Mark, is a physical event. Changing your mind is a physical event. You have to grow new neurites, new synaptic growth cones. Mm -hmm. You have to create, and those neurons just crawl through or the synapses, uh, excuse me, growth cones will crawl through the brain to, to reinforce a pattern that needs to be more efficient. So it's so useful. I think this is so important because yep. it can take people's shame and guilt mm. down tremendously. So often we're blaming ourselves and we're angry with ourselves. If instead we understand our brain is just trying to deal with the limited energy that it has in any one day. And, and if we have that kind of grace and for ourselves, yes, then we have this incredibly new opportunity to do more and to change and, and to be gracious with ourselves. This is why change doesn't happen overnight. You have yeah. to, it, before you can change your body, you have to change your mind. And that is an undeniable truth neurologically. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not just spouting opinions here. This yeah, no. is psychobabble. We're talking about neurology, and it's yeah. it's a but it, then it crosses over into every other aspect of our life, uh, our moods, our behaviors, our relationships. Yeah. Um, so that's why I really have you know for the last 15 years I've had a brain centric practice. Everything is around the brain. So because. That's what we need to engage with if we're going to have the life, the mind, and the body that is going to be of highest contribution mm. in this world at this time. Sounds like you're talking about the concept of mindfulness. It's important because, folks, we, we really need to understand what David is saying. That This is the key, in my opinion to walking in wholeness right here. Begin to change the thoughts will change your world, but the world not out there first, the world in here first. You mentioned early on that we all have the opportunity to create. That's an important concept for people to get, isn't it? Yeah, it it's, is an opportunity. You, you're going to create something. Yep. Every day, you're creating the body you're going to take into tomorrow. You're creating the mind you're going to take into tomorrow. Every day, you are creating, but you have the opportunity to choose which mm -hmm. direction that creation goes. The that is very, is, huh? the, that's the just body. very powerful. I love it. Absolutely. And our, the, the good thing is our body creates health every day for us, mm -hmm. regardless if we care about it or not. I yeah. mean, it's amazing at survival unbelievable we have backup systems on backup systems to make certain that we don't die but we don't really have a lot of systems that teach us how to thrive that's work we have to do from mm. the inside in that is that is our learning that is our meditation that's our mindfulness so mindfulness you're absolutely correct because if you're not aware there's no hope you can make a change so I would actually say that awareness is really the first step. And then as you're aware, you can bring that into your mind in a fuller way. And so mm -hmm. alerts, uh, alarms, uh, you just reminders are amazing to increase your awareness 
uh, then you can focus on being mindful and creating uh, an awareness that is, you know, because the two go together, the more mindful you are, now you become aware of more things. And, and then that perpetuates a cycle that you can actually see in the brain when you're looking mm-hmm. at it electrically. Uh, it shifts our brainwave status. And it's a brainwave status that allows the utility use of our higher centers of learning. I know that this conversation, personally, it has fed my brain. And, and I really appreciate that because that is the key to growing something is feeding it, right? You're feeding it good information. You know, you're, you're in, you do a lot of stuff, you know, and uh, every time I talk to you, you say, Hey, I'm doing this or that. I'm like, Holy, why do you, how do you do that? What, what's your next, uh, what are you working on now? What's your next project? Curing Alzheimer's. I love it. And that can be done <laughs> right there. I'm going to, we're going to, people hear that. You heard Dr. Hazi say that. Well, so uh, you're right. I mean, you asked me, you know, what do, you know, what's most important to me? That's curiosity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I was put on this earth to solve human problems. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of good at solving human problems. I love humans and I love yeah. really hard problems. I've, I, you know, my parents always bought me all these crazy little toys that, you know, solution problems to solve. And I, I love them. And I don't think there's a harder problem than Alzheimer's disease, frankly. Right. Um, you know, we're itching towards 5.5 million people in the United States with that mm. diagnosis right now. Mm-hmm. And as a diagnosis, we've had over 245 drugs that have been tried and failed over the last 19 years. Mm. 245, you know, over $400 billion of money that's been poured into this with nothing new approved. And, but there's, there's hope, there's real hope in a new procedure called um, regenerative plasma exchange. And this is something I've been working on for about four years. Big, long story. I don't think I have time to get into all of it, but essentially it's been found that if we can clean up our plasma, if Mm -hmm. we can get the toxic substances that perpetuate the neurodegeneration of the brain out of the plasma, Mm -hmm. that process of degeneration halts and in some cases starts to reverse if caught early enough. So I'm a certified apheresis specialist. And so Mm -hmm. this is something that not many people do or know how to do because it's a, it's a process that we pull blood out of the body, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of out of one IV and it goes into a centrifuge. Uh, It gets separated out into its cells and then Mm -hmm. all the liquid part, which we call the plasma. And then those cells are uh, against the reconstituted or, you know, liquid is added back to those cells, Mm -hmm. the same amount of the plasma that we took off. uh, And that's returned to the body. And we do that continuously until we've washed out. We've really done a blood washing of one to 1.5 times the amount of blood that's in that person's body. It's really a remarkable procedure. And it's a standard of care for treating severe autoimmune disease. Uh, you can literally see people get better in the chair from symptoms that are uh, have to do with like myasthenia gravis. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, so this taking this well-known, well-studied, well-validated procedure and applying it towards Alzheimer's disease was done in a large study called the AMBAR trial in, um, uh, in both Spain and the United States, over nearly 500 Alzheimer's patients, moderate and, mo- moderate and mild disease were included in this multinational, multi-academic center, uh, randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blinded study, uh, looking at several different arms of how can this plasma exchange be beneficial. And what was found that in individuals with moderate Alzheimer's disease, now let me say, that's a terrible term. There's nothing yeah. moderate about moderate. Moderate Alzheimer's disease means you're institutionalized, likely, and don't remember your family. Mm. You're not. You're no longer. You're not bed bound, no. and and you know your physical decay has not yet started in, in deep earnest. But mentally, but even in that severe of a situation, over 14 months by applying this procedure, um, the rate of decline 
diminished by 60%. So they had 60% less decline over 14 months by having this plasma exchange done regularly. But what's more exciting to me is that in the, because in moderate does Alzheimer's, there's a lot of dead brain already and mm-hmm. resurrection is tough. We yeah. really want to get to the opportunity to get neurons that are struggling to be alive. We want those to be healthy. But in mild Alzheimer's disease, those individuals actually had improvement in many scales over 14 months. They had improvement in attention, improvement in verbal memory, and improvement in overall functioning. That's, that's incredible. To just not have decline is amazing, but to actually have improvement over mm-hmm. the initial measurements in that 14 month period. And this is without all of the other stuff that we're doing. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to come back to one other thing, but I want to say that early intervention to think functionally, to think that yes, bringing in more good things, yeah. taking out more bad things is the fundamental way we support our body's ability to create health. It's just reasonable. It's just common sense. Mm -hmm. And so, well, how do we do that? Well, guess what? We have technology to make that happen and we're doing that. Um, It's really fun. And now we're also tracking our data. Um, I also create a computer platform called Maxwell Brain that Mm. has, we just launched it yesterday. Yesterday. And And we're in July of 2020. Yeah. Yeah. We just launched it yesterday yesterday in Arizona only right now uh, because we're doing a small test trial, but I'm taking all of our systems medicine approaches to Alzheimer's disease so that a comprehensive uh, history, laboratory studies, genetics, Mm -hmm. neurocognitive testing, uh, uh, and a host of other additional testing coming into this. And then we're applying our algorithms and our structured knowledge to figure out what are the multiple causes that are present in that individual that are pushing them towards dementia and uh, Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. Because I don't really believe in Alzheimer's disease, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, Alzheimer's disease is a final common systems failure. Multiple other systems have crumped and failed and then are drugged down the master system, which is Mm -hmm. the brain. And that is actually the way forward is finding all of these contributors and addressing those. So I, and if we do that along with plasma exchange, we get a much better uh, opportunity for improvement and we're going to be tracking our data so that we can continue mm-hmm. to tweak and move this forward. The nice thing is this Maxwell brain is a software platform that doesn't cost patients anything. It doesn't cost doctors anything. And it fulfills all the criteria so doctors can actually bill Medicare for implementing this really complex, these often more complex care plans uh, through some new codes that Medicare has put forward. So I really believe we need to have a higher accessibility to these Mm -hmm. fundamental interventions. And we are looking forward to being able to make this available nationwide uh, after our initial uh, beta test. But we're using Maxwell Brain Mm -hmm to help track our patients that are involved in therapeutic plasma exchange so, so that we know that we're doing well and that we're continuing to make our process uh, ever better. I love that. That's extremely exciting. I, 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 I'm just like so fascinated by, you know, you as an individual person, your friendship has been a, just a absolute treasure in my wife, uh, Michelle and I's life and uh, our brains are better in this world in functioning capacity because of men like David Hawsey. And I really appreciate that. How, how can people get a hold of you? How can they connect with you? Uh, sure. Uh, a couple of ways. Um, I have a website, David MD mm-hmm. And there you can learn more about plasma exchange and, uh, and then our work at the Maxwell clinic in Nashville, Tennessee. And mm-hmm. it's just Maxwell clinic for maximizing wellness uh, a lot of people come in and say, hey, I, I want to see Dr. Maxwell. <laughs> Congratulations. He's well, sitting that, in that chair right there. That would be you. <laughs> exactly. That's the patient, right? And, and so the, we named the clinic really for the, the, the patient who we believe should become Dr. Maxwell. And, um, yeah, and those would be the great ways to get a hold of us. Um, I have a, uh, an intermittent podcast myself. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and I have um, always trying to put out new information mm-hmm. to help people become more 
self-health responsible. Uh, so, because we really have a remarkable capacity to heal. That is something that we have to just continue to remind each other about. We are not stuck. We are mm. not stuck. And every day above ground is another opportunity to heal and to contribute and to bring our gifts to the world. And in doing so, we fulfill our purpose. Uh, it's really a beautiful thing. So it's, it's, it's really just an honor to get mm. into practice medicine and, and to practice in this way. Um, I'm very hopeful that our healthcare system in this time of chaos um, is going to find its roots again, which yeah. is back to Hippocrates, you know, back to first do least harm. You know, yeah. let's be, um, let's see if we can do this better uh, as we come out of this and as we restructure. Uh, but it's going to require people that are thoughtful and uh, are not living out of fear. Mm. But instead, moving each other forward in a way that um, is honoring to who we all are as human beings. Man, this has been a, a treat. Um, really, really appreciate it. You know, our time has came and gone, and, and it usually does when you get into one of these conversations that seems like you're, you're, you're sad and you don't want it to end. But the blessing behind this is that I believe, David, we've created through this conversation a, a hunger to learn more and create more neuroplasticity just by this conversation. So uh, I'm, I'm truly, truly honored. So thank you again for joining me today. Mark, thank you. It's an, an honor to be with you. And you're absolutely right. Just by the fact that people have made it through this to this point. Yep. They already have shifted their brain. There is actually non-negotiable. It's already been done to a degree. Now, to yep. the extent they practice any insights that they've gathered or take action on any of the understandings they have, that can be magnified. But the good news is just life is learning. And, mm. uh, people have changed just as a result of listening along uh, and uh, moving down their path. Thanks for this time, Mark. It's really it's such a joy to be with you. <laughs> well, I love it. Well, friends, thank you for joining us today. And uh, one thing we always ask at the end of these podcast is go ahead and subscribe so you can find out what episodes are upcoming um, in the next week or so and like that. But you've worked really hard to improve your health. You've worked really hard and done a good job listening to this podcast. Don't let the hidden things in health bog you down. So we'll see you next week on another edition of Healthcare's Missing Link.